Good evening. Um, well, I'm, I'm really excited that we're here today for the Let's, our fourth Let's Build event, actually, because we had one in London Build. We're bringing together uh, panelists of BAME and diverse backgrounds who have excelled in the construction industry because we want to showcase and celebrate the work that is done by BAME and diverse architects and professionals. Um, we have a whole lineup for 2020. We have six planned events and we also will be doing three CPDs about soft skills. Having had these three uh, events, we now know that confidence is actually one of the biggest uh, hindrances to progression, we believe, for the BAME community in, in this sector of development. We are excited for the new year. We've had a wonderful turnout and a wonderful evening today uh, with Sonia Watson giving us our, our keynote speech and a closing by Sumita Sinha. We think that this forum is one that is set to continue and is growing in importance in the UK construction industry. Uh, so please look out for it in 2020. Thank you. So the format of this evening is simply a question time format. So with our wonderful panelists here, we will um, I have some set questions which uh, we will answer and then we will also put it out to the audience to please um, contribute. Oh, sorry, before I do that, I need to talk about each of our panelists here. So, Wilfred Achill. He's a senior lecturer at the University of Westminster. He completed a major study uh, at Broadwater Farm, Tottenham, after the 80s riots. He's founder of Mode One Architects, specializing in estate remodeling projects and urban regeneration. He's an external examiner, both nationally <coughs> and internationally, developing new turnkey solutions uh, built models um, for the development uh, of these constructions, and his company is 2PM London Limited. Um, he's also um, appointed to the RIBA R validation panel between 2004 2008. He's an RIBA FC Equal Opportunities Advisor, Architects for Change. He's a director in charge of Living Over the Shop project at the High Street, Walthamstow, working in partnership with Salon Housing Association and Karen View Limited Contractor. He's been a board member of SOC, Soho Housing Association, and he's also been an RIBA architectural advisor. Neva Seri on my right is an architectural designer, graduated from Central St. Martins, where she set up the design collective WH, WUH Architecture. She's a young trustee of the Architecture Foundation and co-founder and director of Black Female Architects. BFA is a social enterprise that seeks to empower black and black mixed heritage women in the built environment. She's been running projects as a youth construction leader at Build Up Foundation and currently works as an architectural designer at Panora and Passard. Fatai Dabri is an architect for over two, year, for over two decades. Fatai has gained valuable experience across numerous sectors, including education, residential, retail, healthcare, and hospitality. After graduating, he began working for a practice in London on a number of luxury residential projects, and subsequently consulting on numerous complex projects where he has supervised both internal teams and external consultants, taking them through the planning process to delivery. Fatai has also worked on the client side, notably for the Olympic Development Authority uh, as its representative on site, where he managed the design variations during the conversion of the athletes' village into residential units. Since joining T.P. Bennett in 2005, he's been leading the delivery team on the University of Sussex campus, campus redevelopment. It includes 27 number new buildings. Dipper, Dipper Joshi is a partner at Flesher Priest Architects, and, uh, and is also a mayor's design advocate. Deepa Joshi is an architect with over 20 years design and implementation experience in areas including residential, commercial, and recording studio design. She is passionate about mixed use regeneration and building better communities. In her role as partner at Flesher Priest Architects, she leads projects across the urban design, 
master planning, architectural and interior design sectors. Deepa is a champion for increasing diversity across the built environment. In her role as Mayor's Design Advocate, she was on the steering group for the Supporting Diversity MDA Working Group, which led to the recent publication of the GLA Handbook. <coughs> Professor Hanif Kara is co-founder and design director of AKT2, a design-led structural and civil engineering firm based in London. His design-led approach and interest in innovative forms pushing material uses and complex analysis methods have allowed him to work at the forefront of the many challenges facing the built environment. Hanif is Professor in Practice of Architectural Technology at the Graduate School of Design, Harvard, and the first engineer to be appointed on the steering committee for the highly regarded International AKAA Aga Khan Award for Architecture. He currently sits on the UK National Infrastructure Commission's Design Task Force, an expert advisory group, and is a member of the HS2 Design Review Panel. He is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the Institution of Civil and Structural Engineers, and an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Sonia Watson, our keynote speaker, has been Chief Executive of the Trust of the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust for five years. Her primary focus has been to continue to ensure Stephen's death leads to positive change by providing a structure for young people who are unrepresented in the profession. She has, with a small team, guided the trust's mission and has made a decisive impact in the career and the chances of their alumni in the built environment and beyond by creating pathways to increase representation, particularly for black and ethnic minority students, into proper jobs and success. Over 132 architects are practicing due to the Building Futures program. On top of the day, on top of this, uh, of her day job, Sonia uh, commissioned the first ever race survey featured in the Architects Journal in 2018, raised 15,000 running the marathon, and has single-handedly brought in <coughs> pro bono support of close to 750,000 pounds to refurbish the center, to deliver workshops and events in support of young people and social enterprise, wishing to co-work or pursue architecture as a career and to make the inside as iconic as the outside. Sonia was awarded her OBE for services to diversity in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in June 2019. What challenges does a lack of diversity create in the design and delivery of buildings in the UK? And Wilfred's going to take this first one. This is quite interesting because I, I want to change the question. I want to start from that because I'm fed up with the negativity that is faced around so once you talk. It's not challenges, it's what are the opportunities. The word is opportunity. And when I started, there wasn't this level of knowledge around the table in the profession. It was said that we weren't in the profession. We are now in the profession at various different levels. So we're all there, so why can't we create opportunities for ourselves? <coughs> we do not have to wait and my thing is, I don't have to wait. We've gone into development and architectural stuff now. My view is, we've got to create our own opportunities. It's about what we want to do. It's not about somebody telling us, let's wait for a project. That is, that is the narrative that's been spun. That's I'm telling you from someone that's been in it a little while. But forget that narrative. We've got to create our own narrative. We've got to tell the story. And our story is about finding like-minded people, create our own opportunities, find the money, get it all sorted out. Don't wait for anybody to bring a site to you and this ideal client. It doesn't exist. And so my position, and I want to say, if we take that as the model, as the grounding for us to develop things, then there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of scope. There's a lot of, but we have to have a vision. And we network, we create the vision and we create things for ourselves. And that's where I'm at at the moment. And that's what I think we should be. And, and that's what I'd like to see moving forward. Excellent. Yeah? Yeah. One of the differences, I suppose, is that I've shocked up. Yeah. And it's partly to do because I rely on people like you, which is architects, to create work, whereas you have to rely on clients and make projects. So when you start talking about challenges and opportunities, one of the first things I would say is we need to identify clients who are willing to invest in us because of who we are, rather than doing what we're doing now, yet again, 
We just talk to each other, we're all converted, we all know what the problems are. My own opinion is that we need to really probably seek out a much higher level in order to, to sort out the opportunity. And that higher level is to go to clients directly who need this service now. Just as much as many of the large developers have been forced to deal with climate change, and they, 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 some of them are dealing with gender issues, but the bigger issue of banning, if we put a proper identity to it, I suspect that some of the clients will soon see the value that all the research is telling us about. So I would approach it from a slightly different direction. Hmm. Okay, deeper. Londoners are speaking out. Now with the consultation and actual rural Londoners are being consulted by um, the, regener the regeneration projects that, that are going on. So, so there's now an obligation to, um, to listen to Londoners. And guess what? Londoners aren't all from the same background as the designers that are, uh, that are delivering the buildings. So it's becoming more important for the designers themselves to actually be representative of the Londoners who are um, who they're designing for. So I think part of what we're doing is, is starting to address that challenge. And I think I'm really pleased as a mayor's design advocate that the GLA are starting to recognise that challenge as well. So until, um, and I think the, the, the challenge that we face is until the, the, the built environment industry actually represents Londoners, it becomes, um, regeneration is still a NIMBY um, activity. A lot of people don't want the regeneration of the project and the built environment um, that, that we're providing because they think it's not for them. So the challenge is to actually make it for them and the way that we're going to do that is more of us need to be actually designing and providing for them so people feel that it's a, um, a, a together activity and they become a YIMBY organisation rather than a NIMBY organisation. Absolutely. So can I talk about delivery, the aspect of, you know, um, diversity and what it means in terms of delivery? Well, I'll say in any sort of organisation or <clears throat> society, I think, it, especially ones like ours or freshers like ours, where it's mainly people-based, it has to be reflective of the people it's serving. At the moment, we don't get that. <clears throat> so, uh, and one of the reasons, one of the <clears throat> things that is happening in our profession is we're depriving ourselves of talent pool like this. Mm. We just don't have this talent pool at all. And it's interesting, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of the McKinsey report, yeah. which speaks about gender diversity increases efficiency by 11%, and it says ethnic diversity is like 30%. 35. And I would say if you combine the two, that's 42%, so you get all women of color in an organization, <laughs> that's it, you're sorted, you know, so that's, so that's why I see it. And also as well, I'll say, um, I think something like role modeling, you know, for kids to look up and say, hang on, I could do what he's doing. You know, someone who looks like me is up there. That sort of thing. I remember when I was growing up, if you were like a, you know, your rebellious stages as a child, teenage stages, and you're quite, you know, becoming like a road man, they'll send you back to Africa or Caribbean, you know, go and stay with grandma for a few years, and you come back completely transformed. And the reason for that is they saw people like themselves in positions of power, mm. you know, positions of doctors, lawyers, judges, and like, wow, I could do this. In those days, you didn't have it. So that's what the challenges we have with them, lack of diversity. We just need that. The talent pool has not been tapped, which is quite parochial at the moment because the demographics are quite homogenous. As our young architect here, yeah. what is your perspective? In London, we have 8 million people, and almost uh, 3 million of them are young people, so that's every fourth person, which is a huge population. Um, and I think there's massive challenges within the education industry, within training, um, that um, stop people from being able to um, become architects. Um, and looking at education, um, there is a, a lack of attitude within, I guess, the industry, in the educational industry, that... Um, it creates a perception for young people that you um, don't necessarily want to come into design because it doesn't look like something that you can achieve. Um, it's not a welcoming environment because you don't see yourself. We spoke about um, role models. Um, so I think there needs to be um, an awareness within um, specifically our education system, within the teachers um, and academics that um, ha have to have um, a sensibility towards those, those young people who are from diverse backgrounds because um, they are not always supported within their journey, specifically when they 
create projects in university that are to do with their own cultural backgrounds. They, um, so within BFA, we almost have um, 200 members now, and 50% um, of those are students. Um, and one of the main current themes is that um, many of those BFA members that they either fail a unit or they don't actually go through it because um, of challenges they face within education. So it's not an issue of not having enough diversity, actually, because there's lots of people who are interested in design and they want to come and they come and enter education, but they don't necessarily able to perform as well as their white counterparts. Um, because also um, they might be new to this profession, so they don't have the networks and the resources to be able to build up themselves and their projects to be up to the standards that they need to be. Um, so we really need to look at the education industry. Wonderful. The other thing about <clears throat> that conversation is race. In my particular case, um, it has always been an advantage, not only in the London situation, <coughs> but in the broad situation all over the world. First of all, Brown, but also secondly, I claim to be everything else as well. So it's, a, it's about how you will change your identity in that situation. So you describe me as a professor of uh, Graduate School of Harvard, professor of architectural technology. Now dig into that. What is that? I mean, I'm not an architect. Technology is something that designers generally don't learn because design world doesn't know anything about technology, in my opinion. That's all for the scientists and so on. So I, I think most of these questions are, are really good to encourage us to rethink what we are. But I would, mm. I would stress that in my case, it's never been a hindrance. I've always broke through the class. And as soon as I talked, um, with, I will quickly tell you one, one very quick anecdote is I did a lot of work in, in uh, Abu Dhabi for many years, and it was all built, and, and quite a lot of it. One of the famous ones is Ahadid's Bridge, mm. which is now called the Sheikh Zayed Bridge. And then I was on CNN for, for thousands of times, speaking about why we should all be in Abu Dhabi, because it's a wonderful place. I can tell you that when I first went there, I was not allowed to speak, because Zaha would be talking. She would have a young white graduate next to her. I was the star engineer that makes everything work, but the Arabs would not speak to me. He would have to go through the graduate until a point when Zaha said, I'm not speaking to you again as a client unless you address this person because he's been working with us doing this. That, from that day, is the reverse. If I now go to Abu Dhabi, they actually put the red carpet out. They recognize the orange and remind me of the CNN. So I think you have to redefine your identity. Okay, the first opening moment might be difficult, but I'm, I think we've gone past trying to you know, walk again on and, and all those things, jumping back to our, our younger people. They do not need to go through any of what we went through. You just do not. You need to go exponentially ahead of what we've done because I think that the redefinition of what we now serve as designers, and I'll stop in a minute, design is the key to all of this. If you are good and talented, you can design your way out of all the problems that you think you've got. And I always find it fascinating that we, we spend some time usually discussing why there are a bunch of people from black and minority ethnic people in the room. I never hear that when there's a bunch of white people in a room. I find that fascinating. We never, we never ask that question. We never, we never ask that question where, where I am never, almost never in a room like this. And I love it. I'm never in a room like this. But we always ask ourselves and we challenge ourselves. Why are we all together? Yeah, why are we doing it? However, let's go. I... Very recently, I, I, it, this being asked to keynote here reminded me of, I was at um, a 100% women, female, very, very prominent women who have a very secret society as lots. And they, they, I, I'm, I'm going to do this a lot on this, on this uh, talk. Um, they were white women. And they were, it, it was called um, a seat at the table, an impossible dream. And we had, we had breakfast at the Walsley. And we were asked to, you know, I was talking to them about what it, what it would take to increase women's uh, representation in uh, places of importance. And they were all very, very senior women. 
And there was one young black, I don't know why I'm, I'm this is not even here. There was one young, um, young, very, very awesome uh, black woman there. Who, she, was, she was in her 30s maybe. Um, and she said, I, you know, I, you know, the only problem is I really don't want to be, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here because, you know, anybody's doing me a favor. You know, I want, I want to get, I want to get to the top on my own. Um, and I said to her, well, um, the job that you're doing, do you think you're good at it? And she said, yeah, you know, I'm great. I'm fantastic. Um, and she, and I said, she said, well, yeah, but you know, I don't want any favors. I want to, I want to get her on merit, you know? And I said, but so if somebody helps you to, to show who you are and to give you the platform, um, do you think you'd be able to do the job? Do you be, would you be good at what you do? And she said, yeah, I'd be brilliant. I said, take it, take the option, take the chance. The way we get young people into architecture, we need to enthuse them. And the only way we can enthuse them is have more people like them. People from non-traditional backgrounds who represent what they look like, where they come from, be it black, white, Asian, whatever race, creed or colour, nationality. We need to make sure that more people look like what we have in London and what represents London as an area, as a district. We are the best city in the whole world. We're the most diverse, racially, socially, economically diverse city in the whole world. And we need to have this representation through architecture, through the built environment, through engineering, through all sorts of building, creative related industries. And that is the only way that we'll actually make a difference by changing the narrative, changing the scene, changing the direction. Tonight's event was very inspiring because the keynote sp uh, speaker, uh, Sonia Watson from the Stephen Lawrence Trust, she basically explained what the Stephen Lawrence Trust over 26 years has done to enthuse young people to get into architecture through the economic support and the mainstream of connections. That's how they've been able to support young people. So tonight's event was enlightening as always, uh, inspirational to have so many people in the room with so many different views talking about an issue that is actually incredibly important, particularly in the current political climate. So I think somebody said tonight that actually we need to switch the word challenges to opportunities. So opportunity doesn't always knock uh, if you are not in the right environment to be able to open the door and to meet those challenges. Uh, are there enough opportunities? I would say, are there ever?